Well, good evening, y'all. Let's, let's uh, look into this. Let me begin by saying that this material is by Beth Barone. And uh, uh, I've mentioned Beth several times. Uh, and she has given us permission to use this. And so uh, I, I uh, went through and tried to, uh, tried to change the language. For her, the, the language was that of circles, which she didn't really like, but that's what she used. And so I tried to change that language to clusters. And uh, because she said you can use whatever, whatever word you want to use. And so I like, I like the term clusters. Because we are a new life, we're about growth. Uh, the things that grow, being part of the vine, I felt that clusters was a was a, a better expression, and we've used it before. But um, uh, so we came up with the clusters. So I've endeavored throughout this to change uh, the terminology inside the packet from circle to clusters. But you may still see a circle or two in there. Maybe I missed one. Uh, there are some things that I couldn't change because, yeah, there are some there are some things in there that uh, uh, that were. We're more like, uh, what's the word I say? They are more like um, uh, diagrams and things that I couldn't get into and change those. So I have endeavored to do this. I brought this in from a PDF format, so things got totally whacked out, and I had to bring everything back together to create this one for you. In fact, I've got a bunch here for overflow. If you have any overflow, these are, from, these are the ones that, that I decided to use hers because I couldn't get, make ours work, and then I made ours work. So, so I decided to keep them just because I can use them if I need to. Uh, in case we have any, any, any need for extra tonight. So let, let's start talking about what is a cluster and, um, and what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, clusters. And this again, this is her material. I'm going to do my best to try and, and, and help make it understandable because um, uh, I've been through this, but, but trying to help you comprehend this as we walk through it. It is ultimately there, the very first line, a group of people intentionally choosing to be friends with God and each other. And that really is the primary focus. It is about relationship. All right? It's about relationship. Other things will be part of it, but it's about relationship, and we always want to keep relationship as core. It is the focus of everything. Now, your group may, may form in all kinds of ways. Your group may form along common interest. It may form along need. It may form along prior relationship of some kind. It will involve at some point learning together. It will involve at some point challenging each other. And, but more than anything else, it's about having fun together and finding healing. Part of, of Beth Barone's um, ministry and her, her focus in ministry is that her belief is that we are just uh, we're all messed up we all have our stuff and we're all endeavoring to find healing we're all endeavoring to find the healing and wholeness that God wants for us and the way to do that is to do that in, in, a, thing called a, in a thing called for us a cluster where we connect with each other we share with each other the goal is to create a, an environment that nurtures relationships, so much so that people can be healed, they can learn to trust God more, they can have deeper relationship amidst all the things that are happening in life, and they can be open for God to work in them. And I believe it's something that God has called all believers to, but not all believers function in this. And so we're, we're actually creating something to, to let this begin to have its place in our, because we don't always seek it out. And so having its place in our, in our church body and uh, moving out to hopefully a, a larger group. As it says there in paragraph number three, the focus is not Bible study. It's not about building spiritual disciplines. It's not about accountability, although those all have a part in what we do. But it's not about those things. It's about relationship and about learning to love people the way that Jesus loves people and that's going to be the challenge it's learning to love people the way Jesus loves people it is that agape love loving and valuing each other with no expectations and you'll say why well, I already do that right I promise you you don't because we don't function that way 
We function in a world full of expectations, and we even in the Christian community live with certain expectations about what we expect of people. And so we want to point people to Jesus. This is about all of us pointing people to Jesus and how we do that. Because everybody is designed for relationship. God made you to have relationship with others. God made you to have intimate relationship with others. I don't simply mean in that the husband and wife relationship. I mean relationship in such a way as to not be afraid to share the deepest parts of you and talk about your struggles and your failures and to put that out there and to be willing to share that. But we also know that it has to happen in a safe place. We're not, we're not asking everybody to do this, to come to the front of the church and everybody just proclaim all of your failures and your weaknesses because uh, that's part of, part of what brings to brokenness in so many places. But instead, rather for us to learn to live in a God-honoring way about how to live for Him. So in this cluster, it's never about me. It's always about us. Say us. us. Say us again. Us. It's about us, not about me. I want you to take me out of your vocabulary, at least when it comes to this. It's hard to eliminate it entirely. But, but to make us the focus of this. Because us, the purpose of this is to create a healthy group. It's got to be everybody in on the same thing. And in order to do that, we have to get rid of some of the what's in it for me stuff that we've, we've lived with. Because this kind of group is not a what's in it for me kind of thing. Oh, you may get something out of it. But the reason why we give ourselves to this is to give ourselves to this. To give ourselves to people. And not just about what I get from this. We're leaving behind statements like, well, what's in it for me? And if this isn't relevant for me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get out. I'm not going to be a part of this. The truth is, when we listen to God on behalf of others, it increases our capacity to grow in our own lives and our personal health as well. So, let's begin by talking about how we create these healthy clusters. First, we've got to decide who's invited. Now, there, will not, there are no leaders in this. I think we'll see this in a little bit. There, there is no hierarchy. But there probably will be people who will be facilitators. I won't say probably, there will be. People who will facilitate. That, that is, make the phone calls, get people together, kind of help make the plan, keep, keep it doing, know this information so they know how we're, we're going. But this is not just for you all that are here, it's for everybody that's part of this in any way, shape, or form as they're part of, as they're part of clusters. So, so the idea is that there will be someone, but, but there's no leader per se, it's an us thing. So we begin by maybe getting with one other person that we feel we'd like to connect with and then talk to them about who's invited. Now, what, what can it be? It, it can be a family circle. We'd like the circles to be between five and eight. So a husband and wife is not a family circle, a family cluster. Okay, a husband and wife doesn't work. But if a family decides, you know what, it can be husband and wife and, and kids and connected kids, if it's that, that's the case, then, then that's a great cluster. You can do that way if you want to. Or, uh, or you can do one around an age group. A group of guys or a group of ladies who are all about the same age, who've kind of all kind of gone through the same experience, want to kind of come together and, and share those things. You can do that. It can be all about matching seasons of life or about a common interest. You know what? Rosie wants the one to have one that's focused on the Dodgers. That's what she wants. <laughs> And Daniel wants one focused on Green Bay Packers. So, I, you know, I, don't, I, I guess that's probably more, pop, more pop, possible in our church than others. Um, yeah. Um, so, the, you know, it's, it's finding a common thing that you can join around. But, yeah, she said. Uh, but it doesn't have to be those things. It can be, you know, it can't simply be Jesus. That could be your common interest. Uh, but it could be those things. It could be a certain kind of thing. That is, you're all on the same team of some kind, same kind of project, whether it might be something that we're doing as a church or something that you're doing separately. But, but to create these kinds of, of groups together to, to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, secondly, consider the needs of the people. We're now on page three. Consider the needs of the people who will be in the circle or in this, in this cluster. What are their scheduling issues? What's their transportation issues? What are the child care issues? You need to take that in consideration. Because that'll, that'll depend upon what time is you're going to meet. 
maybe we're going to have one for, for working moms who can't do it during the day. They're going to have to do it during the night. And maybe there's one for moms who are free during the day, so they're going to do it during the day. Okay? Or even we've got our ladies Bible study right now who meets during the day. Maybe they want to create a circle. You can have that as well. Um, um, finding out schedule, how it works together. And then you begin to ask the question, you know what, do I fit in the circle that I want to create? All right, do I fit in that one? Uh, see, part of my challenge in this is begin trying to determine how I want to do, do this for myself. And, and the reason why I haven't done it was because I couldn't make a decision on that. Part of me wants to do it by ga gathering young men together and just discipling into them. And then part of me says, no, I think I would rather just do it with guys that are all about my same age so that I can just be me and not have to be Pastor Jim. And, and so I can just be that. And in, in both cases, I'm supposed to just be me. But with the younger ones, I'm going to be more Pastor Jim than I am in the other one. So the point is, how, does, how, do I, how do I make that work? And so this is part of this process for me working through. That's why uh, I'm still in the process of putting it all together in my head. Uh, the information... Uh, there will be information studied, but it must apply to the particular group's demographic and what it needs to move forward in relation to life. So you as a group will decide if you want to study something, what you're going to study. Not, it's not going to come from me. I'll make recommendations. There'll be some in here, in fact. But, but you will decide how you want to proceed with this. And, and we'll talk a little bit about not even having any teaching, any learning time for, for months, you know, for, for quite a ways in. Uh, just having it relationship at first. The ideal group size is between five and eight. So if it's couples that want to get together, you had four couples, there's your eight. Now, the point is it can get bigger. And here's the, here's the getting bigger part. Perhaps there's a couple either outside the faith or outside our church or in a different place in life that's going through some stuff that you might want to bring into your circle. And that would be, you know, that'd be uh, nine and ten. But that would be okay because you're coming in, you're working as couples in that way. Um, because I always want us to maintain an idea of bringing in somebody else from the, from quote unquote, from outside or from another place in life to help be part of the mentoring process, the healing process for them. If we're all in the same situation, oftentimes we, we get really comfortable with that. But when we bring somebody else in from outside, it might add a little bit of an edge to our group, and we may not feel quite so confident, but the idea is learning to love and how we learn to love each other. So we create these circles. Initially, the members of the group should be handpicked by the ones creating the, creating the group, the cluster, all right? Initially. So that is you, and you, you can do it by yourself, by the way. You can do it by yourself or you can do it with somebody else to start this process. Uh, and if, if, you, if it's just you, by the way, I, I'm not saying it has to be people in the church. You could pick five people outside of our church. You can do it at work. You can do it wherever you're at. You can do it in your, in your vocation. You can do it wherever you're at. And you invite them into this to be involved in, in relationship. And the, the whole point of this is, again, we're pointing them to Jesus. That is our whole, whole point. But it's not, it's, not, it's not just an evangelism strategy. It is a, a way that we help people in this growth process. So you'll make those decisions about who's going to be part of that. And, and again, you know, a group can't include everybody. So, so here's the thing. Those of you who are here, once you start making your groups... You determine who needs to be in your group. You pray about it. You think about it. You talk it over. You, you add the people to your group that you want to. And don't worry about people not being added to your group because, well, we left somebody out. It's, it's okay. And we have to learn to be okay with that. that. Everybody may not be in one. Some will choose not to because, well, they don't see the point. And others, well, because they, you know what, they weren't in everybody's top ten list. And, and, and a list of people to be involved. And that's okay. That really is all right. We're not trying to be exclusive here. But to a degree, it needs to be exclusive because we've got to build a community of trust. And in order to do that, you know, you're going you're to look at people whom, whom you, you're pretty sure you can trust. And there may be others who don't fit that category for you. So if they're left out, that's okay. There'll be other groups. There'll be other times. There'll be other things that we'll do. Um, 
uh, so once you establish what kind of demographic that you want to have, who you want to include in your group, then, then you're going to reach out and bring those people in. And if someone doesn't fit the demographic, well, it's okay. They don't, the generation, they don't have to be in it. They'll we'll find another group for them at some point um, to be in something else. Okay? So getting started with these groups. Any questions so far? I'm sure there are. Go ahead, Bill. I can see one being revolving around like people involved in the military or something. Sure. George, he beat you to it. I'm just. <laughs> That's usually a George joke. Is that, uh, Are we like necessarily set on a set schedule or anything? You will establish your own schedule. Here's, here's the thing. We haven't really gotten to that yet, but let me give you this. Well, no, it's okay. I don't think, I'm not sure it's really in here too much. But, but the issue is because she doesn't, she said, I don't give you a lot of how. I give you why. I don't give you how. You do your own how. And your own culture and your own so you'll set the time you'll set the location you'll set how long and, and by the way this is an indefinite period of relationship but you might go a year in and go okay we've kind of done what we can do in a year and we're going to move on because part of it is we want these little clusters to develop other clusters right we want the seeds from one cluster to begin to from one person in that cluster to say you know what i want to start another cluster and so they might be in two clusters for a while because they're in this one and they're in this one until this one decides, well, you know what, we, we're all got clusters going on. Let's just all do our other clusters and we won't do this one now. But you've already got relationship. So that's already in place. And so it, it's, designed to, it's designed for reproduction. It's designed for multiplication. It's designed to help in this process of, 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 of forming other groups in a comfortable way. So you will set your own time. How often? I, I'd still recommend probably we, you, you meet fairly regularly as opposed to you know once a month because once a month nothing much can happen in once a month. Um, uh, but you may have to you may decide you know the only time you guys can get together is once a month, and so that's what you may decide to do. So okay, anything else on on any other questions like that? Okay, getting started. Number one, step one: keep relating until it's all about relationship. So if, you, if you've got five strangers, not likely, but you might, you've got five strangers, you want to keep just hanging out together, just relating together without any real, uh, any purpose other than hanging out together for relationship. And you want to do that until that's what's happening. So she says, have fun, laugh, cry, pray, learn together. But it's primarily about relationship itself and valuing each other. Here's the point. And let me, let, me, let me help you with this. How many of you have kids? There's only a couple who don't. But you got kids, right? How much do you value your kids? <laughs> and I know your kids. so. Uh, but you value your kids. You love your kids. If I were to do something to your child, what would you do to me? Yeah, it didn't, didn't matter if you didn't like them that day, Sandy. It still would be a... I can be mad. <laughs> so, so we value our kids. Now, I want you to realize that the person right next to you values their kids as much as you value your kids. Right? Well, you have the same kids. You have the same kids. But let's go across the aisle over here. But you understand what I'm saying? They value their kids, uh, their kids as well. Now, think about this. God values us all. And so valuing each other is primary to this. Because God values us all. God even values people who don't go to our church. God even values people who aren't saved. God even values people who we might think they'll never get saved. God values those people. They're formed in His image, but He loves them because they're His children. And He cares about them. And so how dare us do anything towards them, like judge them, because they're not ours? Imagine that. If you have like a Right. You would still like you would still spend some, quite a bit of time just getting to a group together exactly. that knows each other well before you would start whatever other kind of exactly. reaching out you were gonna do together. Exactly. Whatever it would be would be. You're gonna spend time together first. Get to know each other really well. And before you do anything else. Secondly, um, and he said this she says this may take a while. Learning to value each other could take a while. 
Now, step two, people are there to value one another. If teaching is the focus too soon, it'll feel too much like a class. And so that's why we don't want to bring in teaching too soon. All right? So that relationship first. Number three, be aware of the seasons. Know when to start and when to finish. Yeah, there is a, there's a time to finish. Okay? Not only in terms of the meeting, but in terms of the length of your, of your, uh, of your cluster. There's a time to come to an end on this. And so beware of those kinds of seasons. Here It says here, be journey-minded, not goal-minded. And if you want to see what the goal is, if you go over to page 6 down at the bottom, you'll see what the goal is. What's the goal? It's relationship. Okay? The goal is relationship. So keep your mind on the goal. The goal is not to teach them a book from the Bible. The goal is not to teach them how to study the Bible. We, we do that, that's fine, but that's not the goal of these groups. The goal of these groups is first and foremost and will always be relationship. And then from that, we can do some things together to help us grow together. Okay? So they ask the question, well, what should we say together? Well, so they give you a little commercial here for the Bar One resources, okay? And I recommend them. I, I, I have myself gone through the Pure Love series, uh, and they say you need to go through it several times before you really get it. What, it. what the Pure Love series gets to is really understanding how much God loves you and then learning to love others the same way. That's what the Pure Love series is about. And so... Uh, so I encourage you, if you want to do that, come talk to me. It's, they have control of this, by the way, uh, the Bar One Resources and Beth Barone. They've got such control over these things that you have to go to the website. You have to pay for things through them. I can't get it for you. And so I can give you a discount, but I can't get it for you. So if you decide you want to do these things, and you don't have to do these things. That's why they put them in a little box here. They're great. But you don't have to do these. You can do something else if you want to. But, 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 but they do recommend that you do things that are um, uh, relationship-focused and, and not just, you know, Bible studies. Okay? And I'm not anti-Bible study. But it's, it's more about relationship and about loving God and loving people focused, making that part of it. Uh, so she's got three here that are, that are good. There's the pure one, which is the, her central one. Then there's path to freedom and then what's called basic core values. And... Uh, uh, but remember, relationship is always primary. Now, at the top of page five, it says this. You will know your group is successful when there is true loyalty and strength of relationship for members of the group to stand up for one another and be there for each other when the challenges of life come. So right now, there may not be any challenges that anybody's going through in the group. But when they do come, it's about reaching out and taking the hands of others and walking through this together. And so that's when you know. You know it's working when you get the middle of the night phone call. And someone says, this is happening and I don't know what to do. You know when it's working when you're the first phone call as opposed to the last phone call to find out. If you're the last phone call to find out, that means this group's not working. Okay? It, it, it's about creating these relationships where we can reach out for each other and be there for each other. Now, here are the obstacles to create from to, to obstacles to creating healthy relationships. Number one, gossip. These little words like in here that says unkind truths and aren't helpful, those are her things that she writes in besides these other things, but but uh, uh, unkind truths that aren't helpful. That is gossip erodes trust. So if you get together in a group and, and you're gossiping about somebody outside the group, you don't realize that it's eroding the trust in the group. Even though you're talking about someone so outside the group, everybody, no one's going to trust you. So gossip. Lovingly guard this. This is moment by moment. Uh, for especially the first three to six months. They're not saying you should <laughs> gossip after. But what they're saying is make sure that there's nothing like gossip happening the first three to six months. After that, you might have prayer requests and things that, that you, you, know, you make sure it's not gossip, but you make sure you're not, you're not talking about other people. Okay? Uh, at least for the fir first three to six months. S next, lovingly help people with their weakness. And that is, that's the key here. I want you to understand this. We all have weaknesses. We all have weaknesses. And we're supposed to be lovingly helping each other with those weaknesses. That's the call. 
to this. And so the challenge is to understand that we, we'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit more in a second. But to give people the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to speak into their lives. We'll, there's a, a line we'll get to in just a second I, I, want you, I want you to see. It's also an obstacle called a healthy relationship is advising or counseling. These are not counseling groups. They're not counseling groups. Isn't that you can't support somebody when saying I went through this or those kinds of things. But most of the time people open up and share because they need to know that someone else cares. Not because they want their problem solved. And so if you're all about solving everybody else's problem then your group's not going to succeed because all they want to do is know that you care about it. So be sure and, and not become an advising counseling session. Uh, it says when people, people want to know, they aren't going to listen, so wait for them to ask and be considerate. There will be a time when they may come and say, you know, I really need some advice in this. Ah, there's your key. It's time to give them advice. Okay? But don't give it un, unrequested. Okay? Uh, timing is everything. They need to be ready to be open the door. Instruction and advising may come from a pure heart, but it often results in a vulnerable person building a wall of self-protection. So we're going to let God lead in those areas. Page six. Tips for nurturing healthy relationships. Okay. So off with just be there for each other practically. This is the time when we sacrifice time to participate in someone's life. So what's going on? Someone needs their house clean, so you volunteer to go, your, your whole group goes to help get their house clean. Um, someone's got a baby shower, you help them through. We just had, we just had, a, had a, a bridal shower. You go help. Your, your whole group goes to help you with this. Even if they're not invited, so to speak, they go to help get this done for you. It's being helpful. It's, it's working on these things. Some of you need your yard work done. This would be a great time to have a, have a cluster. Um, uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you have, a, but but the idea is, you know, I got a lot of work to do. Can you guys come help? And the object is, well, you know what, I got something to do, but I'll be there as soon as I can. All right, because we're making ourselves available to that. To say, I want to come and help and work with you on this. How we relate to each other in the clusters demonstrates what we believe relationship with Christ should look like. It is that that's what would Christ do. He would wash his disciples' feet. So what would Jesus do? That's, that's kind of our, our question here is we want it to look kind of like that. This is something that Jesus demonstrated by ministering to other people's needs. And so if we're there in other real life in, in, in situations, when the going gets tough, then, then we know that when the going gets tough, we don't have to believe the lie of the enemy who says no one cares. Because you know, yeah, I've got... Six other people that care about me, care about what I'm going through right now, that you're talking to. Number two, have fun together. And we say that several times throughout this thing, but it's about having fun together. It's, it's, it's about enjoying things together and doing things together. It doesn't have to be spending money together. It's just about doing things together and having a good time, whether it's playing games together or Going to a movie together, or I don't. Movies together is uh, um, you can do that, and it's fun. But but it's not as relational because you go, you hang out, you go watch the movie, you spend your two hours there, and you go home, and you really didn't talk to each other at all. Maybe that's exactly. So uh, unless you're young people today who talk all the time in their movies, that's a whole other story. But that's that's something else is going on. But go and have fun together. Do things together to have fun and, and have a have a great time doing it. And then introduce the seven rules of relationship. And we'll get to that right now. Ready? Look, look across the page to page seven. The seven rules of relationship. Rule number one. Everything is confidential. Rule number two. Everything is confidential. Rule number three. Everything is confidential. And she writes, this is so important, we say it three times. Keep things confidential within your group. Don't let it get out. Don't talk about anything about anybody to anyone. Not even anyone outside of that cluster. And I mean spouses too, unless your spouse is in the cluster with you. Unless the person in the cluster gives you permission to share it with somebody else, don't share it. It's just that simple. Don't share it. 
keep it confidential. Number four, keep short accounts. We're going to get to that in a little bit about, about people and what happens. But that is, yeah, you're going to get your, your toe stepped on. Yeah, someone's going to say the wrong thing. Yeah, something's going to happen. And you're going to get a little offended by it. And you just write it off. You're just going to let go of it. You're not going to hang on to it. And we'll talk a little bit about how, how to get to that in, in this place. Communication is essential. We've got to talk. We've got to communicate. This is clear. Communicate thoroughly everything. Guys, particularly you. Ladies tend to communicate really, really well. Men, you tend to communicate with one-word sentences. And one-word sentences don't work in this way. I'm not even talking to other men. We've got to be willing to communicate thoroughly about the things that we're talking about and what we're thinking about and what we're doing and where we're going. We communicate that completely. Number six, gossip is deadly to you and to the group. So in other words, don't do it. Number seven, lying is sin. I just put, we'll put it that way. If you lie in your group, it's still sin. It's just, you know, it, and it keeps you from experiencing all that God has for you. If you're in a group that's trying to be transparent and all you do is lie in your group, it is not transparent. You don't grow. They don't grow. It's brokenness. So don't lie. Be honest and forthright about everything. Now it says each group and each person in the group may have a particular area of weakness. Okay, and if you see these people are not caring for each other by not following these rules, it must be addressed. Okay, so here's the issue. If you get in a group and you decide, and, and, and after, after a few months in, you've got one person who really isn't ab abiding by these rules. They're not keeping things confidential. They're not keeping short accounts. They are not. Then you need to address that with them in grace and love, but address that with them. And if they still can't do that, then you're going to have to ask them to leave the group. It's that simple. Because the health of the larger group is more important. That doesn't mean they won't find another cluster. It just means they've got to learn a lesson. They, they can't dominate. If the safety of the group is threatened, and that is the, the whole life of the group is threatened, then someone may need to step out of the group. Okay? Any questions about that so far? All right. Navigating the phases of the circle. Of the cluster. I keep saying circle is in front of me, but it's, it's a cluster. It to circle no, I, I want cluster, so I'm going to keep it cluster. I'm just using her notes here. Phase one is the honeymoon phase. Okay? We all know the honeymoon phase, right? Everything's awesome. Everything's great. Everything's wonderful. And you wake up one day and go, why did I marry this person? That's, you know, that's... Really? So... <laughs> I'm just telling you what you told me, honey. And so, uh, uh, it, so the issue is that there's going to be a time where everybody's loving Jesus and loving each other, and it just seems like it's all natural and normal and everything happens. And then you move to phase two. And phase two is when we begin to have favorites. No matter what size the group is, five or eight, there are certain ones who you just connect better with. And that's going to happen. And we're not saying that shouldn't happen. There are certain people that you just have a better connection with, but we're, we're going to try to avoid letting that dictate. Because, see, what happens with that is that all of a sudden now you've got two from this group that are kind of going off by themselves and leaving the rest of the group behind. And that's not what this is called for. What it's called for is for us to, to rub each other the wrong way a little bit. Because as we know each other more, we're going to rub each other the wrong way. It's just going to happen. There are things that we say, things that we do. We'll talk about how that happens in just a second. But things that we say, things we do that, 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 that irk us or that bother us, and we have to adjust. So we, we, we need to learn to value each other even when we don't like each other. And that's what marriage is, right? We value each other, we love each other, even when we don't always like each other. Jesus hugged even the lepers. So we want to be like Jesus, a humble servant who, laid out, who lays down his life. So mercy does not mean giving people time to change. It means valuing them even if they never change. Yeah, it is. She's got some good stuff in here. So mercy is not giving them time to change. Mercy is caring about them even if they never change. That's tough. That's tough. You know, that, that 70 times 7 forgiveness thing that, that disciples talk to Jesus about, it's just, it's just always. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a set time. It's just always. 
just keep forgiving and keep forgiving and keep forgiving. She writes in there, I love this, what we get to is like differing core values. Core values, core values, and let me kind of illustrate this for you because this is her thing that uh, she has come up with. And uh, so I want to just kind of lay it out there. Core values, and you kind of see it on page nine. She's kind of laid it out in the chart there. But core values actually kind of works this way. And, and, and you don't need to know the core values in order to function, but they're just, it's nice to have the core values and how this works. And uh, uh, so basically what she said is that, and, and again, I haven't expressed this. I mean, I've said it about before, but not, not tonight. That Beth Rowan, uh is really sensitive to hearing from Jesus. And, and she really spends a lot of time listening to him. And this stuff that she gets, she, she really uh, is convinced, and, and I am too, that this is stuff that, that Jesus has given to her to help, to help us navigate. It is not equal with the word of God. But it is there to help us navigate, and he gives these things to her. So, so what he gave to her is this, and this is the core values. It, these, are, these are what you value, okay, what you personally value. This is not personality, although it, it, it kind of seems that way. But this is not built on your behavior. It's built on what's going on inside you, the things that you value. So she said there's, there's really four core values, okay? Uh, and, and the first is... Captain. This is a person whose goal it is to arrive. Okay? They want to get there. That's the captain. They, they want to get there. They're on their trip because they want to arrive. And, and their emotional need is to win. They love to win. And we said, someone, some of us would say, well, what's so great about that? But, but it's, it's, it's a drive for them. They've got to get there. They've got to get there first. They've got to win. And their greatest fear is to lose. All right? Then up here, in this section, we have what's called the observer. And you notice that C-O, the first part of core, this person is all about accuracy. Their goal is accuracy. They want things to be always accurate. Their emotional need is they want everything to be calm. And their greatest fear is being wrong. They don't like to be wrong. Over in this segment, we have the relator. Okay, and there's the R. The relator, their goal is relationship. They, they're all about relationship. What's that? Well, she has ER here, so I'm, I'm going with what she has. Uh, she has ER. Is, is there an OR in the other one? There is OR in the other one. Yeah, this one, yeah, one has an E and one has an O. Well, I'll put the O there then. Um, uh, the relator. They're all about relationship. Their emotional need is for security and their fear, the greatest fear, is confrontation. They don't like to confront people. Okay? The last one is the exhorter. So there's the E in core. And the exhorter, their goal is inclusion. Their emotional need is to be happy. They want everybody to be happy. And the greatest fear is rejection. They don't like to be rejected. Now, in this, there's, there are some opposites that have to do with who we are. One is, if you're on this side, you're driven more towards intellect. If you're on this side, you're driven more towards Emotion. Okay? If, and then it works this way, that if you're up on this quadrant, you're more about being. And down here, you're more about doing. All right? Being and doing. Now, her reason for, for, for giving us all of this and that we know all this is because all of us fit on this circle somewhere. Now you might hear some of this and say, well, I think I may be an observer, and likely is that you've got strengths here, but you may have some other parts in you that are kind of like these. And that's what she said, that's pretty common. The least like you is going to be the exhorter. If you're an observer, the least like you is going to be an exhorter. If you're a captain, the least like you is going to be a relator. And how often, she says, and I, I, I would agree with this, how often that in couples, that's who they marry. 
That's who they marry. <laughs> oh, Captain, my Captain. <laughs> and that means, Russ, that you're probably a relator then, huh? And he's a relator. He doesn't like confrontation. So, so you see, there's, there's this. And the reason for understanding all of this is because these are what, these are what you value. All right, this is about value. And, and her statement is this. What happens most of the time when we get hurt with other people is because what I value is different than what you value. Right? So I tread on something that you value and you get your feelings hurt. And you tread on something, and so you respond back to me with something that, that's, that's going to hit something that I value. And now we're in animosity towards each other. The, the greatness of the clusters is we're gonna put, you're, you're going to be in a group and you just can't just walk away from it. You need to walk through that. And learn to love people on all sides of this. Just create a group of just yours. Just yeah. Uh, I promise you, no matter what you'll do, you're going to end up with somebody and and and, and the opposite, because that's just the nature of, of of how it works. And again, and different ones are different. Strong. You you may be you know this is like right in the middle. You may be a little more this way with a little more of this influence and a little less of this influence. You could be you know over here somewhere, a little bit of captain and and a whole lot less of relator. Um, it's just kind of the nature of, of where things fall on this, but. But the issue is that we're all so very, very different. And, and, and here's the problem. Because we're different, sometimes we think that different is bad. And different's not bad. It's just different. Okay? And when people do something that hurt me, I think they're bad. But they're not bad. They're just different. Okay? You see, because no one gets up in the morning saying, you know what, I wonder who I can hurt today. No one gets up thinking about that, do they? And yet, there are some people who get hurt every day, and there are some people who never get seem to get hurt because they've built something around themselves. They don't get hurt. But we learn that these relationships, the way this works is it, it can rub each other very much the wrong way. And so we need to understand a, a little bit about the fact that we're also very different. So that's where we go to then phase three, Phase three is that you have got to be kidding me phase. And this is the phase that needs divine mercy. Divine mercy, not your mercy, because your mercy sucks. But divine mercy will keep going, right? And it's, this, it's in this time that we talk about here, we talk about core values. The truth is, is that we all have areas where we can't. We all have them. There are places where we just simply can't get by. She says here, it says, like if I'm annoyed, someone won't stop talking, it may mean that I value quiet or the ability to think more than I value them. Ouch, she says. See, the problem is, we're, again, we're all about me and not us. So if I'm all about me, it's all about what, what I don't like. She told the story, and I thought it was an, a very, very appropriate story. She said she was on a plane. She, was, she doesn't like to fly. And for some reason, this time, she ended up right in the middle seat of three. And so there's a, a guy on the window seat, and then there was her, and then there was a, a kid in the aisle. And the kid in the aisle was a gum smacker. And she says, there's one thing I don't like. It's gum smackers. And he sat there in that, and he smacked, and he smacked, and he smacked. And finally, the meal came, and she got a little bit of rest. He ate with his mouth open, so that wasn't great. But, but she said that was better than the gum smacking. And she smacked, and, and so, it, but, but when, when the meal was over, what did he do? He got another piece of gum. Started smacking again. And she turned to him, and she said, would you stop smacking your gum? I mean, she yelled at him with, with a turn. And he got up, and he was aghast, and he got up, and he left the seat, and he went, went to the bathroom. Well, she had pulled out her Bible because she was trying to be religious. <laughs> oh, no. And the guy next to her said, you know, would you put your Bible away? You're embarrassing me. She said, and he was right. He was right. You see, the, the issue is the issue is that we, we, we get these things, and we all have our weaknesses, and we all have our things that are going to drive us crazy. They're going to be a problem. We have our can'ts. 
We have different fears and different needs and different values and different weaknesses. And when our emotional need is denied, we malfunction. She has a thing that she calls um, uh, the way that we work. And she says basically there's three parts to it. There is input, there's processing, and there's output. Right? That's pretty basic. I take something in, I process it, I, I, I send it back out. That's what we do in whatever way that is. And that does align with, then, our intellect, our emotions, and our will. And so what she says is that, that what happens is, is that our intellect understands our emotions, we feel about things, and how we feel about things, and we process it through. This is, our, this is our processor, and then our will is the doing. And she says the issue in all of these cases is that our emotions are what is messed up. So, for example, Bill, if I asked you to step up and come up here, you'd come up here, right? Come up here. He's thinking about it. So, well, I, I, I mean, that's what I was going to do. So, so I said, so Bill, I, I gave him something, and he understood the direction. And so I came up here, right? Now, Bill, I want you to take this Bible, and I want you to smash it over George's head. Would you do that for me? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> now, the very fact that he said sure but didn't do it tells me one thing. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Bill. Give Bill a hand, would you? Um, He's chewing gum, by the way. So he's a teacher. He's privileged. So uh, the intellect understood, and the emotion, because he, because he, would, he came up here, right? So the emotion, there's no problem with it. This makes sense. It, it connects with my intellect. I'm, I'm working. It's fine. I come up here, and, he, and his will said, okay, go up there. So he came up here. All right? But then when I said... And there's nothing about why I said was unclear, right? Bill, I said hit George over the head. You, you understood that, right? Uh, that was intellect, all right? Then his emotion kicked in. Now, he knows George, so maybe he did want to hit him over the head. And, but he didn't. But he didn't, which tells me, okay, no, hold on. I don't really want to do that. I'm joking, but I don't really want to do that. The emotion stopped the will from taking place. He didn't hit George over the head. The emotion was the processor. For people that have a messed up processor, this thing doesn't work right, does it? Let's say, I'm, let's say I'm an addict. I'm an addict. So I go through this process, and I, I, I go to church, and I get saved, and, 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 but I'm still having a problem. The problem is here in the processor, because the processor is messed up. In fact, it's not only malfunctioning, it's broken. Because it doesn't make any sense, does it? Does addiction make sense to people who aren't addicts? No. No. But it sure makes plenty of sense to the addict, doesn't it? Well, and I was. Just that it can take up to 12 months for that emotion, the, the brain to recover from addiction, right. from drug addiction, mm -hmm. to begin to function normally. So the will can say, I'm going to get up tomorrow and I'm not going to do this. But the chemical on the brain is messed up. They're, this is still yeah, this is still wrong. So so here's the thing. So they, they go to church. They're they're saved. They go to a program. They get free, and then immediately they get out of the program. And what happens? They go right back to their addiction. Because they haven't dealt with this. Because they haven't dealt with this. The processor is still messed up. They didn't deal with this. They know it's not right. They know they shouldn't do it. They know it's going to kill them. But they but this is not working, and so they keep going back to this. All right. It's because this is messed up. And my statement is, we're all with messed up processors. All of us have them in different ways and shapes and forms, whether it's how we receive love or whatever it might be. But, but none of us live the Bible like we're supposed to, so we've got a problem, don't we? Because all of us intellectually, we, we know the Word of God. And yet, somebody's getting lost, right? It's right here. It's right here. So the object of these groups is to bring healing to this. It's not about the intellect, as good as that is. It's not about the will, as good as that is. This is all about behavior. We're not judging behavior. We're going to look here at the insight of man, why they do what they do, because it's all about the emotions. 
And that's why she creates this thing to help us understand that. And that to understand how this works and how each part has its place um, in working through those things. Uh, she, puts, she puts here at the bottom of page 9, she says, When unhappy, we tend to avoid, accuse, gossip, or blast each other. It's hard to forgive over and over and over and over. As the disciples replied when given this command, we too should pray, increase our faith. Uh, we have to trust God to meet all of our needs. Okay? And so she asked this question at the bottom. If I can't love both my brothers and my enemies, it reveals where I'm lacking God's divine touch in my life. Okay? Questions about that? All right. On to page 10 then. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but, but just to, to begin the idea of what healthy group DNA is. It has a divine DNA, and it en encodes the development and function of a group. And so you look at the group's DNA here with God's divine strength, and, and we need his strength in this. So what we have here is in this, in this in-between, we've got mercy and grace, they equal divine strength. And what, what we mean by that is by operating in God's mercy and God's grace, we have got greater bonds within our group. If I operate on my grace and my mercy, that will eventually run dry and that group will dissolve because I can't love the way I need to love. But if I'm operating on God's mercy and God's grace, we're inviting him into this, then I begin to have, we have these bonds. And you'll notice here, these bonds, it, 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 it has a reproductive quality. Other people are having other, other groups and so on. But it, it says here, it takes about a year to develop divine DNA. Then God plants other people in mind and more outside groups. So, so what we're saying here is it's going to be about a year to get to a healthy group DNA. And then God begins to want people within the group to start other groups. Um, and, and then it talks about, about three deep and multiplication on the other side of that. So we want to make it a safe place so that God can bring truth so that everybody can grow. So we talk about the, these th the three strands there that, that bind it together. One is the mercy DNA. We, have, we begin by valuing each other. So we have to have mercy there. Second strand of DNA is the grace and we say this, that human mercy and God-giving grace equals how we, we express agape love. And then the third strand then is truth, DNA. And we connect to God through grace and mercy, and then God will bring truth. There's a, a line here on page 11 that I just wanted to read. Yeah, don't tell people what's wrong with them. Lead them to God and let God tell them what he wants them to work on. Okay. Yeah, and that, that's what these groups are all about. Yeah. About leading other people to God and let God share it. Now, there's a thing called the corporate soul. I'm not going to really get into the corporate soul. You can look at that yourself. It's just, it's, a, a, what it's saying is your group begins to function as a whole, and there are things that have to happen in the group is that way. But since we're just at the beginning stages of that, you, you can look at that when the time comes, and maybe we'll have another discussion about it. Let's look at healthy systems on the top of page 12. Now it says keep looking at page 11, but it's kind of hard to do that when we're doing it. But, but uh, heavy systems operate this way. God's involved in the input, so, so sending his grace and his truth. And then when God gives grace and truth and the processes within the soul are healed and so we can keep giving mercy and serve healthfully. And then thirdly, relating deeply requires divine grace, which drives us to God because we need his grace. When God's grace is flowing through us, it allows us to grow together, and the whole soul of the entire system will be represented as we laugh and share hurts and feelings and look at truth and do things together. However, she says, but most systems actually work like this. And by systems, she means church groups. Okay? First, we begin with the law. This is how a Christian ought to live. Oh, we don't believe in the law, but we have a certain mindset, a certain predisposition, a certain idea that says this is the way a Christian ought to live. And so we set up first the law. Secondly, then, then, then you have to be held accountable, because that's what the captain value would tell you. You, ha you, are, to, you are to have a, a accountability, and, and so you're going to, you know, we, we, we're going to hold you tightly until you get your own revelation from God. We move up then to what we call human level grace, and that is we pretend we don't mind and their failure doesn't bother us. 
That's human grace. That's not God's grace. Okay. Then, and this is a broken system, it points out. And then finally, we give up. Mercy runs out and we get upset. And we let them go because I don't have anything left for them. That is not a godly statement. Yes, God will one day send people to hell that he loves very, very much. And the time, the clock will run out on them. But God does not quit. He does not quit. Not ever. Not ever. It says the law kills because it leaves God out of the equation. Mercy really establishes value and God's grace brings about a healthy identity. So we're to trust God and value people in order to heal souls. All right. Um, and one thing she points out, and I just want to point that out as well, uh, to watch out. Be, be, be aware of these things. I'm on page 13. Be aware of these things. Number one, don't let the cluster be a hierarchy. It's a us. No one is in charge. There may be a facilitator, but no one is in charge. And we are together in this. God governs the group, and if it's run by grace and mercy, then we'll see growth happen. No lecturing, because it's not a Bible study. It's about us learning and relate to each other. And even if we do study the Bible, it's about nurturing the word within relationship, not lecturing each other about it. Number three, don't let it turn into a hospital. Now, what we mean is it's not, it, it is a place to care for people, and there are damaged people that need care. But be involved because relationship is valuable, not because we're helping each other. This is not the place. This is not a support group. This is not an AA group. This is not what this is. This is a caring group of individuals who help each other. In relationship, we give and we receive. And so it's not just a hospital where there's always one person who's going to give everybody else the direction about how to live their life. So it's, it's lighten up. Go have fun with people. Go have fun with, uh, with God. Now, she does say this, is that and here's the considerations that we move along here, is that as we open this up to people, there are going to be people who come in who, to use the term, poorly socialized. They're wounded. Exactly. Uh, that we open this up to people who are not going to be as good about being open and honest, and, and it could create a whole lot of problems. But she says, just know there might be a mess coming. Be ready in, in the way that this works. Um, <laughs> she says, we, we recommend a ratio of five healthy-ish people for each more deeply wounded person. So if you get in a group and you find someone is deeply wounded, or you in intentionally include someone who's deeply wounded, then be sure and surround them with others who are healthy. And, and so that this person doesn't become always the topic of conversation, always the issue that's going on, but a way to help, help them be healed of their woundedness. Um, and they talked about another option. We won't get into that option. You can read that for yourself if you'd like. Um, so she puts this here. How do people get healthy? Intimate relationship with God. That, that's her little thing. Like for real, she says. Not just as an idea in her head. An intimate relationship with God. Number two, everyone needs a faithful friend. And number three, everyone needs the right information. Okay? Needs the right information. Now, why is that right, right information? Well, it could be something like A Path to Freedom, one of her series, or other kinds of series that, that you might want to walk through. Um, um, but we want to make sure that we're not, we're, that we're walking with them into health and walking with them to something to, to find health. She says, how can we guide people to promote both individual and group health without feeling like it's a correction? And so she kind of gives an idea about how to express that and how to talk to them about that. Uh, and then she talks a little bit here about forced accountability. Don't tell people what to do. Forced accountability just makes people want to lie. Okay? There are two rules. Love God. Love people. All right? And then it, include, then it concludes with this. And, and I'll, you can go through this on your own. But, but learn how to SOS. And the SOS is that process of giving everybody permission that something is happening wrong with them in the course of, of their life, they can send that on SOS 
to everybody else in that group. Okay? You give it to everybody. And it, and it doesn't have to be, they have to call everybody, but they can call one person, the other person can call the other three or four, or however there are. But it's about SOS. When I'm going through something, I need to put out an SOS. And, and, and you can determine in your group what that includes. Okay? An SOS is not, you know, a, um, not necessarily always a, um, uh, a major thing. It could be some smaller things, a, a car issue or something like that that you need help with that you send an SOS to your group. Maybe nobody can fix it, but they, they can all tell you what not to do. Um, um, it could be stuff like that, that, that that's still an SOS if there's an, if there's an issue. But it's not a please don't make it a, um, a cry wolf kind of thing where you're, you're, you're calling people with an SOS or they're calling you with an SOS and it really isn't anything. Don't, don't create those, that kind of environment. But, but create an environment where it's, it's helpful and caring about other people. Um, so, so here's the thing. This is what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to pray about this. There's no sign-up sheet for this to be a part of a cluster because this is going to be your choice. This is up to you. It's up to you if you want this kind of help that comes with this. And we're going to give every resource we can to help in this process, but this is going to be up to you. Secondly, it's up to you who you connect with. Again, it can be people in the church. It can be people outside the church. It can be people related to you. It can be people not related to you. It can be complete strangers if really that's what you want to do because, because you have that kind of heart. But the issue here is we want to, we want to spend time building relationship. I, I want it for the church because I want everybody in my congregation to have relationship. And don't think for a second that, that just, well, I've got a spouse and that's all I need. It's wonderful to have a spouse. I have a helper. She has everything that I need in that. But there are also things that I need to talk about others, even about her, about. That I need to have that kind of conversation and be able to talk about and get some correction or get some, get some clarity or whatever it might be. So we need to have those kind of relationships, and so I, I'm encouraging those kinds of things. So you'll decide who. I would, I, I would, I would determine to get with somebody else uh, that maybe it's in this group tonight, but not necessarily. To get with somebody else who's in this group and begin to think about it and say, well, what, you know, what, what could we do? I want you to pray about it. I want you to think about it. And again, there's, this, this is not a heavy pressure thing because I'm not going to say, okay, well, I'm going to call you and we can say, Did you, have you done it yet? That's not going to happen. I will follow up with you because I know that you've been here. You've heard this about you know, where you need help in the process. And if any, any times in, in the process you need to have to have a question answer, you call me and you say, well, what do you think about this? But you begin the process. You connect with other people and you begin the process of saying, would you be in a cluster with me? Now, if you're including people that, that aren't in this meeting tonight, then you're, you're going to have to communicate with them. You're going to have to tell them what this is all about. Okay? Well, that's why you have this. That's why you, that's why you have this. And, and so you walk them through this and let them understand. I would begin with one other person, and then the two of you make decisions on who should be in your group and what you're trying to focus on. Okay? So this is, it, it, again, it's, it's very broad. And again, she's giving us the, the why, and, and our, our, our permission is to be able to bring it to the what, how we're going to do this, and how we're, what we're going to do this. Sandy? I have a question. Um, when we moved to Palm Springs, uh, I can't believe it was five years. We were there for five mm. years. It didn't seem like five years. We didn't really think we were going to be coming back. And one of the things, or, you know, not to live, and one of the things that, that we ran into when we were there was that after we would visit church, we visited every church in, in the valley. And um, the churches are very transitional. They're snowbirds. Mm -hmm. They grow in the winter and they go down to nothing in the summer. And one of the things we missed, besides this has always been my home, was the connection. Mm -hmm. You know, I love Fred Donaldson. I could walk to his church, but I wasn't connecting mm -hmm. to anybody. And, and uh, so now I'm on the other side of that coin. I would very much like to be part of something like this. I would never be able to facilitate it because I'm gone two months out of the year. So that can be a disruption to a group. I mean, mm -hmm. we'll travel probably half of May, all of June, month and a half, and then again, a half a month, two, three weeks in August. Um, that could be disruptive. And so what I guess I'm saying to you is, my question is, I would like to be part of something like this. I would never be able to facilitate something of our schedule. Mm -hmm. um, but is that a, a big disruption? 
if you're gone for a month, you know, is that is that more no. than a group like this could handle? No, I think I think that's perfect for this kind of group. But what 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 we're saying is, in this in light of this is, how do we make this function when someone can't be there, right? And we know it can still function. Now you'll miss out on some things probably, um, but if they can be in, in communication with you during that time, but you'll set your own schedule. So if you look at it and go, you know what, we're going to meet once a week. But but Sandy can't be here for these weeks, so let's make it let's make a decision. Should we should we meet those weeks or not? She takes everybody with them. <laughs> that she could do that. Everybody, everybody go with them. But 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 you would decide. Okay, well no, we won't meet that this week. But maybe we'll meet the next week. Okay, and then we'll, and then we'll meet the following week. But, so you won't miss all of those things. And so and you'll know what they're going to be involved in that process to, to talk about it because you have your schedule way up in advance. But it's I mean that's part of this process. It is to stay in relationship even when it's not always convenient. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing home groups for 40 years since we were at Plaza, mm -hmm. you know, and it's always been a big part of our life. And that is one of the things that really seriously that we missed right. was that none of the churches that we visited when we were there had any small groups going on. Right. They all said they did in their bulletins, but they hid. They, yeah. weren't, <laughs> they weren't there. <laughs> well, and, and, so, and this is not a home group. And that can, yeah. It can meet in a home, yeah, I understand. Yeah. But this is not a home group. I want to I kind of get that. It, is, it can meet in a home. It can meet in a home, but it doesn't have to meet in a home. You could, I, I I'm kind of was getting some, some of the older guys together. We called it the old guys breakfast. Okay. And, uh, um, and, and getting them together. And, and that could be a circle. And all they're going to do is they're going to get to breakfast. That's all they're going to do. They're going to hang out together and have breakfast together, and they're going to have relationship together. But in that process, they're going to pray for each other, and they're going to have other things. Now, that's always not always comfortable in a restaurant. Sometimes you feel kind of in, in the middle of a restaurant, and it doesn't work as well. But, but, but do that together. That could, be, that could be a circle right there. And so that's, that's part of this. So, so it's, it's, again, it works with your schedule, and it works with what happens for you. So if, it was, if we had a bunch of snowbirds, we don't, but if we had a bunch of snowbirds, the snowbirds would meet when they're here, and then probably wouldn't meet as often because because they're going back to Canada and Minnesota and Michigan and and so maybe they have to meet on the phone or something else during that time. But that's how that would work for for, for that kind of group. Exactly, a whole the same kind of schedule. They're going to be here till this, and then, then then they're going home. Okay, anything else? Okay. So, what's your job right now? Pray. Pray. <laughs> That's step one. What's step two? Find at least one other person to connect with, to begin this process. And then once you've done that, then you begin the process of deciding who else wants, who can be part of your group. All right? And you decide what kind of group that is. What kind of groups can there be? Any kind. Any kind. Okay, you can have couples. You can have just your family if you want. If your family's large enough and you want to do five to eight, you want to do your family. That's fine. I'm not recommending that, but that you can do that. Because um, uh, I think I think there's something that comes. Of course, families we have enough honesty in families to work through stuff. I guess, and you're forced to work through it because you're family. But but I think part of the learning learning to love like Jesus loves is being involved in those situations where you know you got you got two, you know. Disciples who say, well, I want to be first. Right? We, we want to be at your right and your left. And the rest of them go, who do you think you are? We want that. We want that kind of conflict because it's in that kind of conflict that we learn to love like Jesus and to do what Jesus does. Okay, anything else? Okay, Lydia. Where do you come in? Um, as far as, you know, okay, so we pray, we find someone, whatever, and we start a process. Mm-hmm. I will ask, when, when clusters begin, I will ask to see who's going where so that I can know who's plugged in. I, I don't have to have an ongoing report of what you're doing, not at all. I just want to know who's plugged in where. And then when you, if you get to a place where you decide, you know what, we've done it for a year and we kind of feel like we need to let go, then you just let me know that you let go and that everybody's going their own, doing their own thing. But what my, my preference is that after a year of healthy relationship, they're going to want that still. And our encouragement will be, well, why don't you go out and you find five other people? 
So now we've had one group, we've had another group, five other people, and this person's got five other people. And so now we've gone from five to 25 because we've reached out to other people. So, so my job is to help you navigate this process. I'll also be in a group. I'll also be in, a, in, in one of these groups and uh, um, for my own, my own sanity. And uh, so I, you know, that, that'll happen down the road. It's happening, but I'm, I've got to make a decision on that. Uh, my wife will be involved in one. And uh, so we want you to be thinking about it. And, and, and then when you have, once you have kind of your group, then just let me know. Just give me a kind of a thing. I've got these people in my group. Now, if I go a month from now and no one's giving me any kind of names, then we know that this is not moving forward. And we'll talk about it again. But, uh, but we just we want you to, again, you don't have to. And understand, I'm not saying we have to do this. I think God wants us to do this. And, 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 so, and so you need to hear his voice, not my voice. You need to hear his voice and say, God, what would you have me do? And step out because you hear, hear an obedience in, in, in to him, okay? And if you're a little bit intimidated by it, well, I don't know who to ask and I don't know who this. Well, that's why I'm saying pray about it. And let, let me promise you this. I promise you this, that whoever God puts on your heart, God's already doing something in them too. He's already doing something in them. And it'll make it, the possibility to, to come together so that when you ask, oh man, I was thinking about that. Don't worry about rejection. Don't worry about rejection. You, you're going to have some of that. People are going to go, eh, I don't think so. But, but that's okay because they're not ready. They're not prepared for this. They're not prepared to go there. Everybody's not prepared to go there. Okay? But I want you to, to, to feel free to go there. Russ, you were going to... Yeah. And that's, that's where we've messed up, I think. We love people, but we love them as long as they conform. Or, or you have a, you have a, you get together and you want to help them grow and stuff, but there's something out there that's your object rather than right. relationship with each other. Right. Yeah, but your purpose. <laughs> but it's but it's it's getting it's it's getting to right. But it's a different kind of purpose, isn't it? But but the but the it, for Sandy for you, it is helping them find emotional health, and them find spiritual health, and them find the healing that they need. There is a purpose. Because I'm really not that social. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. If you're if you're on this side over here, you're you're much more relational and 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 this is what and if you're on this side over here, I mean if you're if you're if you're you know I think I think if you look at this you'd pretty much say I, I'm an observer. I am not a captain. I am an observer. I like to be on time, but that's something else. But but I I I uh, I'm an observer. This is kind of where I hang out in this area right here. I can do some of that. I can do some of this. I don't. I'm I, I if as a pastor I can do this because I'm forced to. Um, but but it's not where I'm comfortable. So, so the issue is we, you know, we're going to function within a certain way. What, what you're going to find is you're going to have people that just that operate differently than you, and that's okay. That's just okay. And 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 the idea is so that to live through this, to work through this, so that we're developing true, honest relationships, no matter no matter how they connect. And if we're only doing people who are just like us, even that'll be that'll be irritating. You know that, right? George, you said you get, if we get everybody like, just like just like me, it's going to be really irritating. I get really tired of that really fast. Because I, I have three kids that are all pretty much they all fall mm-hmm. similar areas, and no one can make a decision for their life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry, they'll sit there and we can, they can debate for an hour about when mm-hmm. we're going to go to dinner. Mm-hmm. And then they go, well, you always decide anyway, Mom, so why don't you just tell us? <laughs> <laughs> it's very frustrating. Uh-huh. <laughs> 
it to go. You're right. So at, so at some point, um, at some point, we will do a uh, a core values training. We'll talk about core values, and we'll do that as a, whoever wants to be involved in that, and talk about core values and how that works in our lives. Um, uh, it, this was just part of what we want to look at tonight, but I've got to do some more some more work on it myself before I can before I can even teach it, um, and I may have to have her teach it in order to do it. But but. Uh, but I, I think it's it's a it's a it's a beautiful way to understand the differences that we operate on and and how these things do collide and and because we just different uh, you know she says she's she's definitely a relator her husband is a captain uh, he's an Italian his name is Barone so you know he's a real a real Italian was a missionary to Sicily that's the kind of guy he is and uh, and she's a relator and she said she has no she has no care whatsoever about being on time to anything on time to him is ten minutes early right. And they were in marriage and pastoring together. And she was the worship leader. And he's trying to start church, and she's not even there yet. Oh, no. I can see that. I don't understand. You don't understand that at all. <laughs> so, so he's all concerned until he said they were having a really hard time until they sat down and talked about the reasons behind it, the why. And the why is because he values people in their time. And so you start on time because he's valuing them. Well, she loves people. Well, that made sense to her. And so she realized I was stepping all over his value. And he was stepping all over my value because I, I was all about relationship and not about, you know, he's the kind of guy, he, he said, he, said he, he would leave during the final prayer. He would leave church during the final prayer. He's done. He's gone. And she wanted to hang out and talk some more. Well, sound like somebody we know? And, and so... Uh, uh, you know, it's, what a concept. So, so that's why she gets here late, so she can leave later. That's the reason why she does that. Um, uh, <laughs> actually, her, her parents would say, no, that's not a Mexican thing. That's, that's a rosy thing. That's a rosy thing. Um, uh, but but the, the point is, we have these things that, that can collide, but we're learning to love through that. And this is, that's the God kind of love. When we value each one of these equally, because we don't tend to value the opposite as much. Even though we may be married to them, we don't value it the same way. And so we're learning to value those things because all of that is what God has done. All of that. It's, it's not bad. It's just different. Okay? Amy? Amy? Exactly. Yeah. Because we, we probably have three different kinds of people on that on that on that list, but they they all and they probably overlap to a degree, so that there's enough of that similarity that they can get along, and, prob and probably no, probably not one of the three is on the opposite. Because you've got three, you're going to have three sides, and they all love. But uh, uh, so so it it that would that would be a good place to start, a good place to start a, a, a circle, and and uh, common common purpose, common goal. And so you've got that kind of thing going on, and then you add to that what you need to add to that. Okay?